the Veterinary University of Vienna. Uh, he's going to talk about measuring empathy in non-human animals. Example from dog studies. Okay, I think you can hear me. I don't want to sit, so if you don't mind, I want to uh, stand here. And I want to give you some um, insights into the kind of research that we are pursuing in Vienna at this Messerly Research Institute, which is a very interdisciplinary, uh, brand new institute combining uh, philosophy, biology, medicine, uh, and in the near future also psychology into an institute uh, dedicated to research on human-animal interactions and also animal ethics. So we are close to the topic, but my background is zoology, I'm a zoologist and I love to observe and to investigate animals, different animal species, so not only one or two model species as it is called in neurobiology or pharmacology, but really I want to entertain a comparative view uh, and uh, the comparisons that we are doing with different, of course, uh, questions are between primates, for instance, and kia, which is a parrot, or New Zealand parrot, or between dogs and wolves to investigate the process of domestication. Uh, now, domestic pigs and wild boar is also a new, a very new research focus, but also pigeons, tortoise, fish, so many different species. But before I give you this kind of insight into our research, I want to recapitulate a little bit a few things that we have discussed already this morning. So, of course, um, historically there are different uh, ways to, to approach uh, this phenomenon of empathy. And as we have already heard, there are many different uh, views on it, definitions. Uh, as we already heard from Don, there is an old uh, uh, reading about it from Lips, uh, Mr. German word Einfügung. Uh, it is, as we said, feeling what someone else is feeling. So we are now here uh, concerned with feelings. The question is, is this everything in empathy? Is empathy a spontaneous and naturally uh, tuning into other person's feelings? This is also a short version, but a, a bigger version would be that it is, for instance, Tanya Singer is entertaining this view, a neuropsychologist, that empathy is a multifactorial construct. Uh, there are many different aspects, and maybe also many different elements that come together, extending from simple forms like uh, emotional contagion to complex forms of cognitive perspective taking. Uh, of course, here you see already that the effective and the cognitive side are coming together. Uh, the psychologists are very keen in making distinctions, and the, the, the most important distinction is, as we already have heard, between the cognitive and the effective side. They stress this distinction very uh, strongly, and they say that this, this empathy or this multi-factorial uh, construct uh, involves emotion sharing, which is a bottom-up uh, bottom process that we share the emotions of the other uh, individual, but it is also involves executive control. That means that as a top-down process that uh, the neuroscientists and the psychologists have now uh, investigated the brain areas that are involved here, like the anterior cingular cortex, the optofrontal cortex and other brain areas are strongly involved in this top-down process where this empathic reaction is regulated and modulated. Okay, what they also stress is a distinction between self and other. Because if I feel so much into the other, if I put myself into the shoes of the others, maybe then this distinction between them and me is blurred. And psychologists uh, really emphasize strongly that we need this awareness of this distinction between what happens to me and what happens to the other. If I really see someone suffering, of course I may, I may share the kind of feelings, but still I know it is not me, it is the other one. Okay, so this doesn't work. So empathy in this 
perspective entails being in an emotional state evoked by the observation of or the imagination of another person, so it's not even necessary that we observe it immediately, it could also be imagined. We observe this effective state. There is a, at least a partial isomorphism between the emotion, the feelings of the other and my own emotions, at least partially, as we will see then also in the brain sciences that there is a partial overlap in the, in the brain uh, areas that are active here. And again, one is aware that the other person is the source of one's own emotional state. So the emotional state that I feel now, at the moment, the state in which I am, is the result of my observation of another, uh, and not because something happened to me. Uh, what I want to do also is to stress when we are concerned about the em empathic reactions, empathic processes in non-human animals, that we have here a problem, or at least a challenge. On the one hand, we can think like philosophers and human psychologists about empathy that we feel for other humans. So, this is conspecifics, and of course we have here one big advantage, we can ask the other one how he or she feels. So there is a verbal report. Uh, and the next advantage is that uh, we are the same species as the one that we observe. So conspecific empathy. But uh, what we don't know how to do is immediately, I, mean, we, I want to uh, offer you some, some ways to do, but at the beginning it is problematic to study empathy in other species. Because of course we cannot uh, quickly uh, change the perspective of us humans into the perspective of a dog. We have not the body of a dog, we have not the brain of a dog, so we cannot immediately through introspection or whatever uh, know how it feels like to be a bat uh, or a dog or whatever. So this is a problem and this is a problem of animal research uh, in general. So this is one problem, but the second problem is if we for instance study the uh, relationship between humans and dogs, or dogs and humans, which is now a very uh, uh, big uh, area in, uh, in biology and psychology, then what we have here is, is it possible that one of those can be empathic with the other, although he or she has a different body, has different emotional states, has different, a different brain, and so on. So how does it uh, then be possible, or what we said here, we share the emotional state. We cannot share, for instance, the body. We, we cannot share the feeling how it is to rattle the tail, for instance that the dog has, but we don't have. So, there are, of course, there are differences. And I think we should be aware at least that there are problems when we study empathy in other species or empathy between species. Okay, what psychologists then do is to uh, 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 differentiate different versions or meanings or elements of empathic reactions or emotion sharing, starting with the simple one, which is mimicry, which is also a share, but not of emotions, but is a, a kind of a motor mimicry. So imagine a, a flock of birds, one is uh, flying off and the others are also doing it. Uh, so this is motor mimicry. Uh, when emotion comes into uh, place, then we have emotional contagion, which is also a very automatic, reflexive uh, reaction that we can also observe in us humans, so it's not only non animals. Then we come to empathy, later to concern and compassion, so we do something, and finally pro social behavior. All those are, as this illustration implies, are interlinked, there are relations, but the question of course is which ones, and also historically, when I say historically, I mean both kind of time uh, perspectives, 
short-term perspective is ontogeny, how does this develop in the single individual? And the long-term perspective is phylogeny, how has those abilities or processes or whatever have developed uh, over the long run in evolution. So, when we start with emotional contagion, we have at least three uh, ways in, uh, in which emotional contagion maybe phylogenetically has resulted, uh, or has, has, um, has been followed. One is empathy, that is other oriented, feeling into, as we heard already. Second one is sympathy, it's also other oriented and is feeling with. And finally, uh, personal distress, which is more self-oriented and yeah, maybe also the reverse of emotion. So these distinctions are written here. I don't want to get into details here and, and quickly come to the neuroscientific views. So what I want to do is I want to compare the philosophical, historical view, the psychological view, the neuroscientific view, and then finally, of course, the evolutionary biological uh, view. So the neuroscientific view, so the whole research is, of course, with new techniques of brain imaging and so on, to find out what are the underlying mechanisms. Where in the brain are areas that are activated, that are you know, active if we uh, feel with others, if we are empathic, uh, and so on and so on. And what you can see here in this uh, uh, diagram is that here are green and red uh, spots. So this is of course the neuroscientists kind of illustrating those activities, which usually of course in the brain we don't have red and green spots, so this is only an illustration. And what is here is uh, pain empathy, so this is the main topic in neuroscience on empathy is pain empathy, unfortunately, so I'm more interested in the positive emotions and empathy, but in, the, in, in what is dominating in psychology, in neurobiology, is always these negative feelings or emotions. Uh, so distress and pain and suffering and I don't know what. But of course you can also imagine that empathy is, is on, is on uh, working on the other side, the positive side. So what we have here is pain empathy. You see this is pain-related activation associated either with experiencing pain oneself. So these are the green blobs. So the brain uh, areas that are active when you yourself feel a needle in your finger, for instance, these are the green ones, and then when you observe another person with the needle being inserted onto the skin, are the red blobs. And you see here, they are very close, they are not the same, so they are not identical, but they are very close together. And we already know that mirror neurons, the whole study about mirror neurons, is really very uh, interested in those processes where in the brain is, is what happening and then of course uh, what is really a problem for the mirror neuron people is if we find a dissociation of the green and the red colors because then it's obviously not a single neuron or a network of neurons that is active in both cases but it's only a kind of an overlap. Okay, what we know is that part of this neural activation is automatic, but empathy, as we already heard, is flexible, it may be regulated, so there are, uh, it is malleable, and uh, there are several aspects of, of the situation or respects in which uh, this empathic response is uh, modulated or changed, for instance, by the context or by the partner, so for instance we are more empathic with familiar people than with non-familiar, there is the in-group, out-group dissociation and so on and so on. Also with our own experiences, etc. So there is a, a huge uh, a big literature on how empathy, for instance, of pain is modulated, is uh, changed is, uh, and is uh, regulated by other areas of the brain, as I said, by frontal areas. Good. The mirror neurons, we have already heard about them. Originally, they started to find out that, for instance, close to here in Parma, they found out that monkeys, that they resonate, that they 
they have uh, areas in the premotor cortex, this was the most exciting aspect of the whole thing, that they are in the premotor cortex, not in the frontal cortex. So in the premotor cortex you have neurons that are active if you do a specific uh, action, like grasping a, a grape, uh, and if you see another one doing this action, and or like this opening the fingers or whatever, so simple motor acts are um, here under investigation and we find in this premotor cortex uh, that there are cells, so not the whole premotor cortex, but there are groups of cells that are active in both cases if you do something or if you observe something else. But nowadays we know that these are not the only neurons that resonate in this way, but in humans at least we know that the parietal cortex, the infraparietal cortex, parts of the temporal cortex and even parts of the frontal cortex are involved in this mirror neural network and therefore the story is much more complex uh, in, in humans than in monkeys. So later on people like Kaisers and Galese and others found out that uh, we have not only a kind of resonance in the motor uh, uh, domain but also in the emotional domain that we, we uh, have neurons that are active also in both cases when we feel disgust or when we see another one uh, having uh, this feeling of disgust or uh, other cases as well. And one main area in this, uh, uh, in this perspective is the insula, which is uh, one of these uh, core centers of empathic brain responses. Good. I will skip the, the yeah, more details about these studies. Uh, yeah, I also skip the videos, which are very, very hmm, ugly. And show you this is a kind of an overview of neuroscientists like uh, Klaus Lang in Vienna and Jean Desit in Chicago, where they put those things together. So you have the bottom up effect, the perception action coupling. Uh, which is uh, generating some uh, representations of the whole situation, but then you have uh, also a top-down process coming from the, the frontal cortex, which has executive control over those representations. There you have the self-other distinction, there you have the modulation, the context specificity, etc. The experience coming to place, etc. So the automatic bottom-up uh, response is then accompanied by a top-down uh, response, a regulation, a control. But as I told you, I want to emphasize the evolutionary perspective, how all these things came about. What are the historical uh, sources of our empathic, uh, 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 of empathy in, 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 uh, in humans or in other animals? And there are several people saying that the whole thing comes from parental care. It is really necessary for parents uh, to uh, observe what the uh, what, what the, the, the offspring is doing, but also what happens to them. They have to react to any kind of distress of the offspring, and it should, they should react in a manner that would benefit them in the in the short term, but also in the long run. So there is a kind of a fitness advantage of parents that are concerned about their offspring, that are uh, observing them closely and that they feel empathic with them. So this may be, we cannot of course prove it because it had happened millions of millions of years ago, but it is a, I think a, a very uh, appealing uh, scenario. Uh, people like Franz de Waal, whom we have, uh, have mentioned this morning several times, uh, is one who wants to make the bridge from this uh, automatic, reflexive, uh, emotional, contagious responses to pro-social behavior. So, and he is now, and he has developed this scenario where he has this so-called Russian doll model. I don't know where I have it. Yeah, I have it here. Where you have a core, uh, a 
an evolutionary old mechanism of perception action coupling, so it is very close to the idea of mirror neurons, and this uh, uh, mechanism is responsible for motor mimicry as well as for emotional contagion. But uh, there are outside layers, they are in evolutionary terms uh, uh, much younger and not shared by so many animals. And here we have now sympathetic concern, consolation uh, on the emotional side, coordination of shared goals on the, on the imitation side. And we have the outer, uh, outermost layer is about true imitation, where we not only mimic what we see, but we do it in a select, selective way, by taking into account the situation in which the model is showing something. So this is also called rational imitation. And on the side of, of emotions, we have here, as it is called, true empathy. Uh, so it involves then this cognitive elements of perspective taking, of targeted helping, of taking into account what are the real needs of the, of the target, uh, which are maybe different from my own needs. I have to take into, into account what is the situation in which uh, I should help or not, and so on. So this is a, a model uh, developed by Franz de Waal several years ago, and uh, yeah, I think it has uh, a quite a high degree of possibility. Good. So skip this. What is the evidence for it? Of course, since these uh, papers of, of the Waal and Preston about 10 years ago, there are several studies uh, that have been uh, provided some evidence for this uh, perception action a coupling or a, a model. So, for instance, in rats, uh, we find rats that are uh, pressed. They have learned to press the bar in order to uh, reduce or terminate even the distress of, of an object suspended by us. Uh, we have read the decreased bar pressing for an object that is being shocked. So uh, when they have learned bar pressing means the shock to another one, they immediately uh, terminate this bar pressing, uh, although it is not of any benefit for themselves. Then, uh, yes, we find in several uh, studies where uh, conspecifics are uh, stressed by observing distress in uh, group mates, like also in pigeons. And uh, yes, and then there are uh, quite a, a couple of studies in rats, mice, and, and chicken, which are going more into. Uh, true empathy and pro-social behavior, and they will quickly present in only two studies so that you get an impression of what is going on here in literature. So first of all, Chris Nicol and her team at Bristol, they started chickens, and what you see here is they started them in four conditions. What, they, what happened to them is very simple uh, thing, it's a simple stimulus, not very harmful, but still uh, not nice to them. It is an air puff. In air puff administered. Okay? And so, in one condition, the hen and the chick, the hen can observe what is going on with the, uh, in the chicken compartment, and both of them are in neighboring boxes, but there's nothing happening. Then there is an air puff administered to the hen only, or to the chicken, or this is a noise control, there's something that sounds like an air puff, but there's no air puff actually on either the chicken or the hen. And now what they observed, or what they investigated is, what is the hen doing in the situation when the chicken is getting the air puff, or when she uh, herself gets the air puff. What they found is that when there is an air puff to the hen, then you see she reacts with standing alert, looking around what is happening, she's less breathing then, uh, there is a decreased eye temperature, which is also kind of a stress reaction, emotional stress. Okay, that's it. Now let this compare to when the air puff is administered to the chicken, but not to the hen, but the hen observes this. Oh, so, this okay. so what you see is the same things are happening in the, in the hen, plus there are some more reactions. For instance, 
a higher heart rate. This higher heart rate, this increasing heart rate, is not happening when the hen herself is getting the air bath, but when the chicken is getting it, and also more clucking, this buck, 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 which is a kind of an alarm call, but also a call follow me. So she wants to kind of rescue the chicken. And this is happening only when she sees the, 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 the chicken. So this is the kind of parental care behavior uh, accompanied by some stress responses, heart rate and so on, that tells you that it is not only the same which is what is going on in the hen when she gets the air puff or the chicken, but there is more in it. And this is some, yeah, some evidence that it is not only emotional contagion, it's not only shared the same, but there is more into it. Okay, and yeah, that's no reason. So the problem over here is, and I will cite from her paper, is however, direct evidence would be required to conclude that the hen's response to APC, this is the air puff to the chicken, was negative, as it might simply indicate a non balanced and so non emotional reaction. Aching, for example, to arousal, interest, hated attention to the behavior of the chicks. So the balance of this behavior of the hen is not clear, the balance of her reactions. Future research should focus on efforts to determine the valence of the responses of farmed or any animals to perceived conspecific distress. So I think this is now a very important point because all those reactions of animals when they observe distress, pain, whatever, in others, you cannot be sure if this is an emotional reaction or is this only arousal, interest, attention, whatever. So this is, of course, clear. And uh, after Mike Mendel and others, Russell Barrett, we can frame the emotions of animals in uh, categorizing them into uh, four corners. You have the, the positive uh, kind of uh, feelings, the core effects, and the negative one. So we have here this dimension is the valence from positive on the right side to negative on the left side. But you have another dimension, and this is important, that the other dimension is arousal. So high arousal or low arousal. And you have to distinguish between arousal and emotion if you study emotions in animals. Okay, the, the second example from the research that we are not doing, but we are jealous of it, is from her, Ben Amin Bartal and her supervisor, Mason, with rats. A rat is caged, is trapped, uh, and of course there are some reactions it wants to get out, and then you have other rats. And the rats can help by opening this box that they have learned how to open it, how to free uh, this red. And this is now a huge uh, uh, of work. Several papers came out in very high uh, journals like science where they found out several aspects of really empathic and pro-social behavior. So they had many different controls. For instance, the red could also open a box where there is chocolate which a rat usually wants. Huh? And of course the rat is also opening the chocolate box, but at the same time also the box with the trapped uh, conspecific and then shares the chocolate. You can also do this with rats that have no experience with this kind of trap. You can do this with rats where the, the, the one that you free is familiar, is a, is, a, is a group mate, or is unfamiliar, and you would find uh, differences. So in this uh, very recent paper of last year, you would find that social experience is necessary for a rat to do this behavior, to help in this way. It's not genetically deterred. Uh, it is group, if they are grouped together for some time, not very long, then they do this, but not if they are completely unfamiliar to the others. So social interactions are really uh, necessary to form the bond and to elicit this empathy and helping behavior. So now I come to uh, my own research and I want to start with this uh, slide. 
uh, emphasizing again that we have a basis where everything starts and this is social influence, this is mimicry, this is emotional contagion and there are for instance uh, behaviors that have been used to study this, for instance laughing and more prominently yawning. So in humans we know if we yawn we are, uh, yeah, if we see someone yawning then we are uh, yeah, also uh, is it to yawn? And this is also uh, now uh, has been found in chimpanzees, in orangutans, but very recently in our own uh, studies also in tortoises. But in dogs, it is contentious because we have several uh, papers where dogs have been found yawning when they see another dog or even the human owner yawning or not. The very last research is again positive and what they found from Eriko is that dogs yawn contagiously to humans that are yawning but only if the humans are familiar to them and not if they are not familiar which is very important and a second thing is that they really yawn not as a stress response this was the objection here but because there is no heart rate increase and so on and other measures of stress that they measured uh, this was not uh, a stress response, but it's really a true uh, and uh, uh, contagious yawning. And also, the dogs do not yawn to simple mouth openings, which are not true yawns by the humans. So all this shows that this is really contagious yawning, and I think this is the best uh, evidence that we have at the moment. Empathy in dogs, I will skip this. Yeah, there are several questions. There is another study that I will quickly uh, refer to by Kestens and Meyer in, in 2012. What they did is the following. There are two people in the room and the dog. One is the, the owner and the partner of the dog. And the other one is an unfamiliar experiment. And both are either crying or humming. So from the vocalization it's quite similar, but the one is emotional, crying, and the other is only humming. And then and, and they had several controls, and in one case the owner was crying and the other one was humming, or the experimenter was crying and the owner was humming. And in all those cases what we found is that the dog was immediately uh, approaching the one who was crying, not the one who was humming. And this irrespective uh, if it was the owner or it was the experimenter, which shows that it's not only to reduce your own distress, so as a dog, maybe if you see and hear someone crying, then you may feel also bad uh, and have distress and then you only want to, to uh, uh, be close to someone in order to reduce your own uh, stress. But this is not the case, or this is the argument, if you are going to a stranger that you don't know. This may happen if you go to to the owner but not to the stranger. And so there's some, some evidence now also for these empathic reactions in dogs. But nevertheless, as we have heard before from the chickens, we don't know exactly the valence, the emotional content of this reaction of the dog when the dog is observing this crime behavior. And therefore what we need, urgently need, is an objective, realistic, assessment of emotions of animals. And this, as I said, is not easy because we cannot ask the animals. There is no verbal report. So what we need is an indirect way to measure emotions in animals. I skip this. This is only... Um, yeah, okay. Um, our own approach uh, in, 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 the, in the dog research was to measure several ways how dogs perceive us as humans because, as I said, one focuses on human-animal interaction and in this case it's human-dog interaction and of course we are living with pets, we are living with dogs and cats and so on and the question is not only how we perceive them and how we feel with them as we heard already today but it's also the other way around how does a dog perceive us, perceive the owner or other humans and what kind of information can they extract uh, and can they really share our emotions, our feelings. 
So one uh, um, kind of research that we entertained for some years is how they look at us, what they perceive in us, uh, what kind of information do they extract from looking at us. And we know that they are very, very attentive sometimes looking at us, try to anticipate what the owner, what the human person is doing next, etc. etc. They can also be informed by quite subtle cues, like only looking where there is some food hidden, etc. etc. So there is quite some evidence, but of course this has nothing to do uh, in the first place with emotions. So our project that we started three years ago was to measure at the same time from one individual dog in a specific situation where we stimulate the dog with emotional stimuli to measure uh, several uh, reactions, physiological responses in the dog and then try to correlate those. So it's not a simple measurement like heart rate, but we do heart rate, as you see here, we do saliva sampling, we do body temperature uh, measurements, we do tail wagging, because we know that the tail is really uh, a strong signal, uh, and we do also eye tracking. So we want to find out where the dog is looking uh, in, in the stimuli degree that we show. So this is the kind of approach where generally we want to call it. And so here this is one study and this is mainly on eye tracking. I only show you the eye tracking data where we compared pet dogs and lab dogs. Because we thought pet dogs have a much more intimate, stronger uh, relationship to humans, especially to some specific humans like the owner, than lab dogs. The lab dogs that are living in a pack on the campus of the university, of course they see students uh, passing by, of course sometimes they are used for, for uh, uh, teaching purposes, but they have no close, intimate bond relationship to humans as pet dogs have. And we want to find out are the differences in how those dogs look at us, simply how they look at us, if they are pet dogs or lab dogs. So this was this, this is the study, and you see here this is the experimental room. We have a kind of a stand where the dog is standing, so it's not lying, because then maybe it falls asleep. So it's standing completely alert, and on a big screen, here you see, we can present pictures, but we can also present movies, video clips, and so on. And we are only interested in how the dog is looking. So it's not forced to do anything, it's only trained, of course, to stand still and to have the head on this kind of chin raising. So to feel comfortable, and you see here in the next picture, this is Teddy and Julie, my PhD student, and Teddy is standing here, you don't see the chin rest, you see here the eye tracking camera, and then there are some videos that are uh, presented, and of course the dog is always rewarded, it is interactive, you can go out and in, etc. So it's not a kind of, uh, of a sleep game. And then we can show, for instance, that kind of stimuli, one and the same person, uh, it could be a familiar person or an unfamiliar person, in different emotional, uh, different emotional expressions, like neutral, happy, angry, sad. The question was, how does the dog react if the dog would see the owner, for instance, in an angry, or in a happy, or in a sad mood. And if there is a kind of emotion sharing, we should find some emotional responses, heart rate change, stress, saliva, uh, maybe the body temperature, uh, whatever, tape wagging, or how the dog is looking uh, at those faces. And you see, yes, we can then heat maps, I want to go into details. The first preliminary results are there is no significant difference between pet dogs, so this is always the, uh, uh, pet dogs and lab dogs. There's no difference in the, the, uh, how often they look or the mean fixation into the, into the face. So in general there's not much difference, but if you look more carefully you find some differences. So for instance, how they look at the mouth. So how they look at the green and the blue, so the blue is the pet dog and the lab dog is the green.
screen one and you see that the pet dog is fixating the mouse more often than the lap dog. Maybe, so this is speculation, sorry, maybe because we are not only looking at our dogs, but what are we doing, especially Italian people? Talking. <laughs> also to the dogs. So maybe this is a stronger signal to pet dogs than to lap dogs. A speculation. But you see, there is a strong uh, difference here. Uh, there are more subtle differences, also how to look at the forehead uh, and so on. I don't want to go into detail. It's only to give you an example how this kind of research is going on, where we try to objectively measure what is going on in an animal when it looks at, at human people. Also, we found that most of them are looking first to the lower part and then always upwards to the eye part. So it's different from how we humans look at humans because we usually look immediately into the eyes first and then the rest of the face. Yeah, you see the differences. Ten minutes? I don't have so many slides. <laughs> really? That long? No, so I have. I have something to show. So the next was then emotional faces to discriminate. So do they understand emotions of humans if they look into the face? What we, of course, immediately can. Huh? And I'm sure the dogs can immediately recognize and understand the emotions that are signaled by other dogs. No question. But the big question is the heterospecific kind of recognition. Do dogs that live together with us for quite some time try or begin to understand what our facial expressions mean? Because they are different from dog facial expressions. Dog are not, dogs, for instance, are not laughing like we. We open the mouth and we show our teeth and this is laughing. If a dog is doing this, be careful. It's not laughing. And we know, for instance, from uh, Mainz, Lincoln, Kerstin Mainz, that three, four and five year old children, human children, make this mistake and this is one of the big reasons for the biting. So, the expressions are different. Then the question is, would the dog nevertheless find out, understand, learn what these expressions mean? So, a Japanese group of people, Nakasawa, they did this, so they trained the dogs on a, on a learning procedure with the frontal face and the, face, oh, the head from behind. This is only yeah, a pilot study, and then they showed them always the same person in two uh, expressions. One is neutral, neutral look, and one is happy. Okay, different people, and what they found is the dogs can learn this. They can learn to discriminate happy from neutral faces. Okay, you can say this is a perceptual problem because they look different. Of course, if you do this with different people and then you generalize this to people that you have never seen, then this is more categorization and generalization. The question is, what features have they used to generalize? And very interestingly, so dogs can do this, they can generalize this discrimination to new people they have never seen before. But what was interesting is, they can do this, interestingly, they can do this only if they are trained with males they can generalize to other males, but not females. If they are trained to females, they can generalize to new female faces, but not male faces. So you see, this is quite a subtle kind of feature that they have learned to make the discrimination. It is not, uh, it's, it's gender specific. The big problem that we had with this paper, and I hope you share my concern, is that there is a quite easy distinction or feature to discriminate between a happy and a neutral face. What is this feature? If you look. Teeth. What? Teeth. The teeth. Exactly. The teeth. So even if the dogs would not look at those pictures as if these are faces, even if they do not recognize this is a face and of course not recognize what the emotions are, whatever. With this white horizontal stripe, they can do everything. 
Okay? So this is not really good evidence that, as the authors claimed, that the dogs can discriminate between emotions. So okay, so this is okay, a good starting point for us to, to do uh, another study, uh, to replicate this uh, and to do it more carefully. And this is what we have done, and this is my last experiment that I show. In five minutes it's done. Yes, these are the authors. Skip this. So, what you see here is Teddy and Michel and others in front of the touchscreen apparatus where we show those faces and they have to touch with the nose the one that they believe is the correct one because one is always rewarded with food and the other one not. So they have to learn by trial and error what is the correct picture. Okay, and we have uh, started with 20 adult pet dogs of different breeds uh, and, and both sexes, etc. Et so this is the basic setup. I show you if this is working, the video, and you can maybe better understand what is going on. This is Mikkel, and you see the pictures appear, and then Mikkel is touching and is getting a reward. Touching and a reward. Always one uh, piece of uh, dry pellet is coming out. Touching and reward. And you see, that it's always rewarded, it's not always rewarded, it has to touch the correct face. Finally, you see a mistake. Yes, this is a mistake. So when they do a mistake, then the picture is red, the screen uh, went red, and then um, has no food, of course. So what was the discrimination here? Yes, again, between two emotions. In this case, it's happy and not neutral, but angry. So a happy face and angry face of the same person. But, I hope you have recognized that there is a difference. They only see or saw half faces. Half the group, yeah, half the group saw the lower part of the face and the other half the upper part. So half of them the upper part, half of them the lower part. And then also in two versions. Half of them had to touch the happy one Huh? This, uh, this one, the happy, and half of them have to touch the angry one, also in both cases. So actually we had four groups. So now we've uh, trained them until they, they reach a criterion where they discriminate, and we had not only one person, but I think 20 or 25 people that they had to discriminate at once. But only half of the, of the face was visible. Okay, and the first surprising result, yes, and then we did the, no, I skip this for a moment, because this is confusing. So this is the training result, and what you see here in the training is that those that have been rewarded for touching the angry one, the angry face, they took three times as long with this learning than those that have to touch the happy one. Although the pictures are the same, the task actually is the same. Still, they, they took three times as long. Why? One speculation is that they don't like to touch an angry face. This is the only uh, explanation that we have. There was no difference in whether they had to learn the upper or the lower part. There was no difference. We thought maybe the upper is, is, is more difficult, the lower one with the, with the mouse is easier. No, this was not the case. And then we did the test. And the test is now interesting. What we tested is interspersed in a normal training course, where they got the, the training examples, interspersed at some points, we had test pictures. Either we take an other face, a face that they have never seen, but of the same uh, uh, half of the face, so if they have been trained with the lower half, then again a, a lower half face. But faces they have never seen. Or they get the same face they have seen in the training, but now the other half. Not the lower, but the upper half. Or, this is the most difficult and for us the crucial test, this is a new face they have never seen, and it's also the other half. And this is on their control. So the question is, can they, if they have learned to discriminate, let's say, the lower halves of faces 
in happy memory, can they transfer this knowledge, whatever it is, to the upper half? And you see, here it is not possible to learn an easy perceptual feature like the teeth. Because if you have learned the teeth, yeah, you're hopeless and you see the eyes. And we discussed this a lot, some conferences, etc., and also the reviewers. None of them found any simple explanation in terms of a simple perceptual cue present in the training pictures. So our explanation is they can do so only by, mem by remembering, by retrieving from memory what they know about emotional faces in humans. In memory means they have learned this during everyday life with humans that are sometimes happy, sometimes angry. So what they did is obviously they have used their experience about emotional faces from the everyday life and brought this into uh, the lab, so to speak. Which is a quite high level of abstraction because those pictures on the touchscreen are much smaller, they are static, they don't smell, they don't move. So it is quite an abstraction to even recognize this is a human face, but even more so to recognize the emotions behind it. I think with this kind of experiments, we are coming closer to find out what are the processes going on in animals that don't share the same body, the same brain, what is going on, uh, especially if they are stimulated with specific emotional stimuli. The next step, I want to tell you, this is my last word, the next step we want to go is to look into the brain of a dog, of a fully awake, fully aware, if dogs are aware at all, fully aware dog. That means we train them to go into the fMRI scanner, then we present them stimuli like those, huh? and then we look where in the brain is what active. When they do something, when they see something, is there also this kind of matching, of sharing or not? I think this is the even better approach to look also into the brain and not only uh, into behavior uh, and expression and physiology. That's what I want to present and I hope I was in time and thank you for your patience.